So hello everyone. My name is Lauren McLeod. I'm from the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I'm the Southern Region Urban Wildlife Coordinator here in the Las Vegas area. We also have Claire Clark from Nevada Department of Wildlife and she's going to be helping a bunch today uh, to answer any questions that you might have throughout the webinar uh, on the computer side of things. So before we get started, I just want to run over a few webinar basics if it's something you're not as familiar with. Uh, just so you know, you can see and hear me. Uh, I can't see and hear you though. So if you do have questions or comments, please try to make use of that question and answer option and the chat option. And in doing so, just be mindful that this webinar is for all ages. So it's absolutely necessary that we make any remarks that abide by a PG rating uh, and failure to do so is gonna result in a participation being revoked. So just be nice to everyone. And you know we all wanna hear everyone's questions and comments so we can all learn something today. And we are gonna spend this time learning about the characteristics and behaviors of nesting birds, uh, some of which we might be finding in our own backyards this time of year. I know uh, some folks have been sharing in the chat, some of those birds that they've been seeing lately in their backyard. And I've been seeing a lot of hummingbirds as of late, which is nice to see. We're approaching the spring season, so we're gonna be seeing more and more uh, as time goes on here. Uh, so a lot of what we're gonna focus on today is how to identify some of these birds uh, in their life cycle. And some of those situations that do or do not require intervention from those well-intentioned animal lovers like ourselves. So you may have realized from your expert identification skills that this isn't a bird. Uh, this is a giraffe. This is an animal maybe you've seen in a zoo or elsewhere. And just like us, giraffes have very unique adaptations to allow them to survive in their habitat. Uh, so what I'd like us to do is let's start to make use of that chat if you haven't already. I would love for you to share some of those adaptations that you think giraffes might have. And so that essentially means any of those features that help them to survive in the environment that they're a part of. So anything that might be unique to them that allows them to get those things they need to survive, like that food, that water, shelter, and space. And when you're using the chat, just be mindful that if you uh, change the settings so you're writing to everyone instead of just the panelists, that allows for everyone that's participating today to see your answers and not just Claire and I. And so we'd love for you to do that so that we can have these conversations with everyone that's participating. So right now, I just want you to share some of those features or adaptations that you think giraffes have to help them survive. Oh, Michelle says, long necks to reach leaves at the tops of trees. Yeah, absolutely. Eduardo says their tongues are adapted to grab branches with thorns. Yes, very good. Awesome. Ooh, Claire says enlarged hearts to pump blood all the way up to that neck. That's really cool. I didn't know that. That's super neat. Awesome. Their tongues are blue to protect from the sun. Wow, this is amazing. Y'all are giraffe experts. <laughs> I love it. This is gonna be fun today. So I love and keep sharing in the chat. I'd love to hear some more. Um, it sounds like we did run over some of those adaptations that y'all are familiar with, like those long necks that helps them reach high in the trees for leaves. Their camouflage that helps them stay hidden in the savannas of Africa. And their lips and their tongue we've mentioned are reinforced so they can handle the abrasive thorns of the vegetation they eat. A lot of that vegetation is usually those acacias and we have similar acacias here that have those thorns on them. So very good. Uh, so you might be asking why we're talking about giraffes on a webinar about baby birds, but I, you know, I do want to say that we're going somewhere with this. Uh, essentially it's, you know, think about you and I and all other humans. We, we can't necessarily survive with the same set of environmental factors that giraffes or other animals can. So, you know, they have those abrasive lips and tongues to allow them to eat those acacia thorns. You know, how long do you think that we could eat those acacia leaves before we would notice some ne negative effects from that? Or, you know, if you're caught in a situation where you were unable to care for yourself, do you think you would be able to trust a giraffe to take care of you or take care of your child? 
There are some things that we may be able to provide and they may be able to provide like warmth and protection, but the best caretakers for any animals, including ourselves, including giraffes, are those animals that have the same unique requirements for survival. So, you know, as, as friendly as a giraffe mom might be, they're not gonna teach us to drive a car or help us with our math homework. You know, they have different requirements for, for survival than we as humans do. And that goes both ways too. So it's just really important to be mindful of that whenever we're seeing any young wildlife out in the wild and out in our neighborhoods. So just remembering that parents are usually the best caretakers for any animal that you're seeing. And when we see a baby bird that looks helpless, it's really important just to evaluate that situation. You know, walking away from an animal that appears in need of help can be really difficult. But in most scenarios, the best chance of survival for these animals is with those natural parents. So we are going to run through today all the cool ways that we can evaluate any situations when we do run into baby birds. We are approaching March, which means we are going to see a lot of baby birds coming up. I know, you know, myself, I've already seen a, a few birds in the neighborhood starting to pair up and get ready for nesting season, seeing some of that nest building activity. So soon enough, we are going to see some of these baby birds coming around in our neighborhoods. And some of the things that we're going to run over today just to help us evaluate that situation is, you know, first and foremost, determine what kind of bird we may have found and do they actually need help? And from there, we can run over some of those things we can do if intervening does seem necessary in the circumstance that we found. And we're gonna discuss some other considerations too that may require uh, additional considerations for what we should take for our course of action too. So there are certain circumstances that might be unique compared to some of those other ones. So there's three stages of baby birds. Uh, the first is hatchlings. We have nestlings and we have fledglings. And these are going to be the three stages that we're gonna dig into some more detail on and how to identify those three types of baby birds and get into the details a little bit more. The photos you see here too, that shows uh, baby American robins transitioning from that hatchling to that fledgling phase over a course of a couple of weeks. And you might notice that in one of these stages, the nest is looking a little bit crowded for comfort. And so that's something that we're gonna discuss as well. So hatchlings, there are some key identifying factors that play into identifying a hatchling bird. And this is really similar for a lot of different birds. They all have pretty similar distinct defining characteristics that might indicate that they're a hatchling. Uh, as their name implies, they're birds that have very recently hatched out of their eggs. So their eyes are usually still closed. They will have a few wispy or downy feathers, so really like fluffy looking feathers, but you'll still be able to see some of their bare skin below that as well. So those feathers are just beginning to sprout at this stage. Um, and for most songbirds and a lot of birds, this means that they're usually only a few days old. That can depend on the type of bird you're looking at. Some have much longer phases that they go through, but for a lot of the songbirds that we see, a uh, hatchling phase is just a few days long. Um, and these birds too, their beaks usually appear abnormally large for their body. So they look kind of like aliens more than birds. Uh, <laughs> So keeping in mind that when you're seeing a hatchling, it might even be hard to identify what kind of hatchling just because they do look so absurd. And baby birds at this stage of life, they're completely dependent on their parents for food and care. So, I mean, their eyes aren't even open. They can't keep themselves warm. They don't have enough feathers yet. So at this stage, they'll huddle with their parents and with their siblings for warmth and rely completely on their parents for a food source. And then after a few days as the hatchling grows, their eyes are now open and it is becoming a nestling. And so most nestlings are anywhere between three and 13 days old. They're beginning to look a little bit more bird-like. They may have a few actual feathers forming instead of that fluffy down 
So you can see in this photo here too, their feathers might appear to have this waxy coating. Uh, and this just means that they're newly sprouted and they haven't been groomed or like, fluffed out just yet. And these guys are typically a little bit more capable of taking care of themselves than hatchlings are. I mean, they do have their eyes open, they have a little bit more mobility, but for the most part, they're still very dependent on their parents and that parental care if they're going to survive. And that third and final stage, we are thinking about this hatchling that's developed into a nestling. And after two or so weeks of sharing a room with their siblings, that nursery is starting to get a little bit too crowded for comfort. So at this point, the parents are gonna start the process of luring their nestlings out of the nest so that they can begin a new and more independent phase of life. And you know, just look at these photos here too. They're, uh, they're getting a little big for that space for all of them to live in. And you know, this process that the parents take their baby birds through, it's sort of like an evolutionary compromise between parents. They want their now big and loud chicks to leave as early as possible versus the offspring who might want to stay as long as they can so they can continue to reap those benefits of free room and board. So, you know, this might sound familiar if you're an empty nester or have left the nest yourself as well. Uh, and when nestlings leave the nest too early, you know, they fly poorly, they may not be able to fly at all. And that's because their wings are small and underdeveloped. And it's in a nestling's best interest to remain in its nest for as long as possible. So it can allow its wings that time necessary to develop more fully. Uh, and this way it's time spent flightless and vulnerable on the ground is a little bit more minimal. But remaining in the nest for too long is tremendously dangerous for many bird species. So this is where that evolutionary compromise comes into play where those parents want them to leave earlier because when these babies are getting super big, they're also getting super loud and they essentially act as a beacon for predators. So when a predator discovers an occupied nest, they can kill all the nestlings in one go. And since bird nests are stationary objects, it's usually just a matter of time or hours, minutes before a nest fills with chicks is on the verge of transitioning to fledglings and it's discovered and then transformed into lunch. So, you know, this is especially true for birds that build those open cup nests, like a lot of those nests that we do see in our trees or shrubs around. So, you know, when these birds are getting too big and too loud, it really is in their best interest. And that's why the parents do this, is lure them out of the nest so that they can uh, cope with a better chance of survival. And so when we're identifying fledglings, that stage where they are going to hop out of the nest, there are a few things that we can look for in the, in, uh, the identifying factors of a fledgling. So, you know, this is the process where they're essentially just learning to be a bird. The, the term fledgling, it comes from the verge fledging or to fledge. This is the uh, act of becoming flight ready. So in birds, that means this is the time when they're not gonna to return to the nest. Instead, they wanna spend the next couple of weeks kind of awkwardly hopping around and finding their wings and discovering what it takes to be a bird. And their feathers in a fledgling will look a little bit more developed than the nestling. So you might still see some of that fluffy down like in this photo poking through some of those other feathers in a fledgling. Um, but they are definitely getting more of those flight ready feathers. So they'll have transformed from like that alien state and now they're looking more like a miniature bird. And they're beginning to gain independence from their parents now, which is a vital stage required for a bird to learn those essential survival skills when it is ready to be completely independent. And you know, for most bird species in urban areas, this takes approximately 30 days from when eggs are laid until chicks are able to fully fly or fledge. So we have those first two weeks that are spent in the nest as their nestlings uh, and hatchling phases. And then the last two weeks are that phase where they're hopping around on the ground and you know maybe banging into things and 
kind of fly a little bit here and there, but can't necessarily fly as much as they would in a full adult stage. And some birds do take longer too. So uh, ravens, for example, they can take up to 48 days to fledge. There's a lot of owls too that will take a little bit longer as well. So it's just something to keep in mind too is, you know, they definitely are more, more vulnerable on the ground like this, but it is a, a very necessary stage for them to go through so that they do learn that independence. And they do come in all sizes too. I just wanted to share a few fun photos. So this is of a hummingbird in Nevada. And this shows the nestling phase. You see those eyes that are still open. And then that photo on the right shows that fledgling phase. So at this point, those birds should be pretty ready to leave that nest. They're looking alert, they can stand upright, and they should be learning that side of independence that they need for survival. And uh, this is a barn owl uh, nestling and fledgling we see on the left and the right. So it has that really fluffy down feathers on it. And then we see the fledglings getting some of those flight feathers. And with barn owls and great horn owls, they're some of the slowest to develop. So they'll stay in or near the nest for six weeks or more uh, before they begin taking their first flights around seven to eight weeks old. And even uh, this nestling that you see on the ground on the left photo, it's not uncommon for them to be on the ground even in that phase, just because a lot of barn owls will actually if they're not roosting in higher areas, they'll find little cavities in the ground that they can nest into. So it's likely that that bird is probably very close to where its nesting area is. So, you know, if they can be holes in trees, they can be caves, ledges, and really wherever there isn't any of those things, they can find areas where they can dig their own nest cavities. And so this can be in uh, river banks or soil, anything like that. So, once we've determined how we can identify uh, those characteristics for what kind of baby bird we might have found, now we need to determine the best steps, steps that we can take uh, if we do come across one in our own yard. So I'm sure a lot of us have come across a baby bird at one point or another, and it is something that, you know, we want to make sure that these birds are making it all right and doing what they can to survive in this harsh world of nature. Uh, so understanding exactly what we're seeing is definitely the most important so we can determine what sort of steps we should take. And we should also ask ourselves some questions to assess the situation. So there's three questions that we can ask. One, I would say, first question is, am I a bird? And if this answer is no, then just give yourself the friendly reminder that there are other birds that are likely the best caretakers uh, for the little one that you found. And then after we've determined that we're probably not a bird, we can determine what kind of bird it is that we found. And so this is where we wanna see, have we found a hatchling or a nestling or a fledgling? And third, are there any immediate dangers? So. These are things that might factor into how you react. So thinking about the surroundings, where you found the bird and what is around that bird too, to determine the best course of action from there. So we'll start first with a hatchling or a nestling. So these are those birds, if we remember, the hatchling doesn't even have its eyes open yet. Uh, what we see here in the photo there, it is fresh out of the egg doesn't have any feathers really, might be getting some down. Uh, and same goes for a nestling, their eyes might be open, but they still look like aliens. So if you're seeing those alien-like birds, it's likely a hatchling or a nestling. And they can fall out of their nest for a number of different reasons. Uh, predators might have gotten to the nest and they made it out of that situation. Weather, if it's super windy, we have a storm, that can push birds out of the nest. Uh, selfish siblings too, or um, there are some birds that even invade the nests of other birds and push those siblings out. So there's a lot of different factors that can contribute to why you might be seeing a bird this young on the ground nearby. And when we do see these birds this young, you know, it's not fully developed, it can't stand or perch. So if we are able to help, it might be in its best interest for us to intervene in some way. 
So, you know, if you can't find the nest, I would say first and foremost, you see this bird, look around in the area and see if you can find a nest nearby. Sometimes they can be kind of hidden, you know, look underneath the rafter, rafters of a facility of your house, look in the trees and nearby shrubs, look in the ground under shrubs too, if it's a ground nester. Looking for things like these is a great way uh, to determine if you can return that bird to its nest. And if you do find the nest, just put it back in. Uh, it's definitely in its best interest to return to that nesting area. So you may have heard the myth that uh, if you touch a baby bird, then the parents won't return to the nest because it'll smell humans on the baby. Uh, most birds actually don't have a sense of smell. So they're not gonna smell any human contact. Uh, I would say, you know, the most important thing to keep in mind with that though, is that we wanna minimize and limit our contact with birds as much as possible. So if you see the nest, it's a quick pick it up, put it in the nest, give it space because you know, we are huge scary predators to most animals and especially animals that are, you know, smaller than the size of our hand. So for us to be handling those birds too much, it's super stressful for them. And that actually can pretty de have devastating effects on their survival. So if we see the nest, it's just picking it up, putting it in the nest and giving it space so that the parents can continue to provide care for this baby. And if you can't make or find a nest, then you can make your own nest. And so there's a few different ways you can make them. We'll go over it in just, uh, just a second. But essentially with that, you just place the bird in and you place it somewhere safe, super close to where you found it because that's likely where the other nest was. Uh, and so then the parents will be able to locate it and care for it in its new dwelling. And that's not a foreign concept to these parent birds. You know, baby birds are super loud and vocal. And so their parents, it's not going to take long before they hear their screaming baby somewhere and they're able to care for it in its new dwelling. And I would say the, the most important thing with the nest location is just making sure that it's a few feet off the ground uh, and under cover, under a shrub or something like that, just so it's protected from those elements and potential predators like cats and things like that. And uh, you know, if you do wanna take that course, if you wanna make an artificial nest, these are just some examples of the many ways that you can do it. Uh, I would say the simplest and most efficient though, I mean, you really don't have to go ham on it at all. You can just get a cardboard box uh, and put the bird in. You know, if there's nearby vegetation, you can put that in to just to have a little bit of warmth nearby for it. Um, making sure though, one very important thing is, you know, depending on the size of the bird you find, but make sure the lip of the box, so the height of it is not too high, so maybe a couple inches because when that bird is ready to fledge, you want them to be able to hop and do their awkward hoppy thing and get out of the box when they're ready. So we don't wanna trap these birds in these boxes. So just making sure that it's got a pretty low lip so they're able to escape it when they are ready to. And just a note that you see on this list, there's the good stuff and then there's that not so good stuff too. So if we can try to avoid using any of those that you see on the not go so good stuff list. Uh, and for a lot of these, the main thing is just the chemicals that might be found in dryer lint or you know, chemically treated pet fur, human hair too. We use shampoos and conditioners with chemicals. And same with you know, strings and ribbons, they have dyes. And a uh, landscape fabric too, something to keep in mind with landscape fabric in your gardens that it can get tangled up in birds' legs and wings really easily. So it can kind of cause a hazardous situation for them with those things as well. And I, I see a comment in the chat, I think it was from the last photo of the uh, nestling that it looks a tiny bit like a spider. I could see that, yeah. I think in general, it's a, a very simple way to determine whether you're seeing a hatchling versus a fledgling is, does one look super weird and not so much like a bird? And then does the other look more like a bird? And that's usually a good way to see what you're looking at. So we've determined what we can do with those hatchlings and those fledglings. You know, it's, it's just finding the nest, it's putting that bird back in the nest. You know, it, the parents still need to take care of it fully. Uh, something that we run into more on the ground uh, when it comes to baby bird season is definitely the fledglings. 
just because this is a natural process that they go through. So it is more often seen that we'll see these baby birds on the ground. Uh, and so if you see them hopping or fluttering or walking around in your yard, it, you know, it might appear to be injured. Uh, it's very easily mistaken just because they really aren't good at doing much yet. They're not good at walking, they're not good at flying. And so oftentimes they do look pretty injured or just lost in general. You know, and you might hear them even crying out for their parent birds too, but none of this is something to be alarmed by. So at this stage, the, the birds are just learning how to be independent. Uh, it's a process that's necessary for them to develop those survival skills that they need. And it's, it's required for adulthood so that they can better survive when they are fully ready to. So if you do see a fledgling, just Take a look around, you know, observe the area, give it space if you're looking around though too. So make sure that you're not standing right over the bird, but you might notice, you know, the parents, they might be out hunting for food. They might be tending to other siblings that are younger and haven't left the nest yet, or they might be perched in a nearby tree looking at the fledgling to making, making sure that predators like us aren't getting too close to them. Uh, so, you know, like any recent empty nest or these, the parents, they're still gonna provide food when their young one needs it. They're gonna be by their side in a jiffy to defend them if any sort of dangers presents themselves their way. So if we find a fledgling bird, if it looks clumsy and lost, just leave it alone, give it space. You know, we might wanna to try to put a fledgling back in its nest, but chances are if we do do that, the now, you know, annoyed and stressed out bird it's probably just gonna hop back out again, which could lead to potential injury if that nest is high up. You know, they can only do that so many times. Um, or it can draw fatal attention to not only that loud fledgling that's now in the nest, but possibly those younger siblings that are not ready to fledge yet as well. And so if you do decide that you need to rescue the bird or remove it from its natural environment, just remember that you are probably gonna be doing more harm than good in that situation. So, you know, now the parents aren't able to locate their little one and provide that care that it needs, you know, and the parents know better than us, like what sort of nutritional needs that baby bird has, especially. So, and there, there are special circumstances to this, of course, too. So for example, if you find a fledgling that's in a parking lot, um, or maybe in a dog park or something like that, you know, if it's an immediate danger, then you can intervene, just try to do so with as little impact as possible. So, you know, if it's in the mid middle of a busy road, just move it to the side of the road. Uh, you know, if you do see a nest nearby, move it to that side of the road, not back in the nest, but just near that location. Um, you know, or if you see the parents around too, that's a good indication of which side of the road it might be on. So if a songbird has fallen in your pool, you know, they're hopping around, they're finding their way, they're not able to fly well. So it does happen, fledglings might fall into pools or other bodies of water. So if you do see that, yeah, definitely take it out and leave it somewhere where it can dry out and somewhere that it's protected. But again, just very nearby to where it was found. Uh, and I would say most importantly too, when you're seeing fledglings out in your yard, it's just keep your dogs and, you know, especially your cats inside or very closely supervised on a leash while uh, that fledgling is going through this phase. So just a, a quick stat to, you know, cats kill between, I think it's like 1.3 billion, maybe 4 billion birds per year. Um, so it's especially important during nesting season that we try to do our part to minimize that number just a little bit. You know, if we do want them to go outside and play, just supervise them super closely. And especially during the spring nesting season. So spring nesting season, it's usually around here, uh, March through August. So we're just about approaching it now and it'll go through the summer months, more through the summer months in the uh, Northern parts of our state as well. And I would say the, the highest nesting activity we typical, typically see is between April through June around then. All right, so now we're gonna go into some of those other special circumstances too. So say we've ruled out that this baby bird we found is doing natural baby bird things. So maybe we found a bird 
that's an adult uh, and has clear injuries, you know, or a young one that has clear injuries, you know, you witnessed it falling victim to a predator or your pet cat or something of that sort. So, you know, as animal lovers, I know we're all here today, we're joining on a webinar about baby birds, probably because we care about baby birds, right? So, you know, it can be difficult to come to terms with how we should react to birds that we come across that might be injured, you know, whether it pertains to hatchling, nestling, fledgling, adult, any of that. Uh, I would say first and foremost, though, when we do come across these birds, it's important not to try to feed it. Uh, and that's because we could probably be doing more harm than good. Uh, you know, remember that giraffe scenario? We're not birds, we're not giraffes. Um, giraffes can't teach us math, vice versa. So, you know, we don't have, as humans, you know, we don't have the professional experience to gauge the needs of the birds we found. I don't have that professional experience. You know, there are, there are people that are trained specifically in the nutritional needs of birds. Um, but I would say as members of the general public like ourselves, we should not try to feed these birds because we could be doing it much more harm than good if we're giving it the wrong kinds of nutrition. And really like all bird species vary in their nutritional levels. This can vary between seasons, between the age of the bird. And so the best thing we can do is just not to feed it, you know, not to intervene in that sort of way uh, because that's likely not gonna help it so much. So, you know, we can determine what kind of bird we have and if there are licensed rehabbers for the bird we found. You know, I'll say in the state of Nevada, it's uh, a resource that we're lacking pretty strongly at this time. We have uh, one licensed rehabber, but she's only able to handle raptors. So that's the eagles, the hawks, the falcons, any of the owl species. When it comes to other birds, we currently don't have any licensed rehabbers that are equipped to take in some of those birds. And so keeping that in mind, you know, a lot of what we can do for those kinds of birds is just giving it that space to recover and keeping it away from any of those imminent dangers that might be in the area. Uh, something else to consider too is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, so this requires state and federal permits to legally rescue or rehabilitate any migratory birds. And when we think of migratory birds, we're thinking of a pretty long list of most of the birds that we'll probably run into in our state of Nevada here. So most birds are migratory and a part of this list. And you can go on the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service website and they actually have a species list that shows all of those migratory birds that are included. And uh, just to give you some background on that quickly, uh, and this is directly from, from the act, the treaty itself, uh, it was established in 1918, uh, and it essentially just prohibits any human interference on protected migratory bird species. So that also includes the active nests of such birds. Uh, in order to tamper with any of that in any way, you need prior authorization or permits from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so again, this includes most birds that are in Nevada. The bird species list contains over a thousand birds. Uh, so you can assume that it's pertaining to the bird that you might be coming across uh, in any sort of situation. And, you know, migratory birds in North America, these are birds that move south each fall to more temperate wintering grounds. Uh, and then in the spring, they may return north to breed and raise their young. And again, you know, the only licensed rehabbers that we have in this area are those that deal with raptors. So, you know, if you do run into a raptor that has an injury of any sort, call us at end down, we can help you out to uh, direct you to the right person to help you in that as well. Um, but if it's not a raptor, the best thing we can do is just let nature take its course. So, you know, I know that's, it's a hard thing to do, but oftentimes it is the best thing for these birds because they are surprisingly resilient animals. Uh, so it definitely wouldn't be a shocker if they were able to recover from any minor wing injuries or otherwise. If you need to do anything at all, I would just recommend, you know, placing it somewhere in the shade off the ground, you know, if possible, just to reduce potential predation on it and keep your pets inside during that time too. 
And I want you to, you know, consider any injury that we have too. If we break a finger, an arm, you know, things do heal. Bodies are meant to heal in some way or another. It just takes that vulnerable period of recovery um, before it is able to fully recover. And uh, just on the note, uh, because we are approaching nesting season for a lot of birds, and I know a lot of us do have pools, uh, I do want to just have a quick side note. Just the, and this is going to be a, a separate side discussion too. We have some other webinars on this too. So I'm just going to make a quick mention. But uh, waterfowl, like this goose you see here, I think ducks, uh, their active nests are also protected under this law. So if you do have a pool or a friend with a pool that has dealt with any nuisance waterfowl, uh, it's important to keep in mind this Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So, you know, at first it's, it can be super cute to watch ducks in your pool, you know, it's nature in action, right in your backyard. Um, but then they start pooping everywhere. They might clog your filter. Uh, they might even become territorial and start chasing you anytime that you want to enjoy what you know they now consider their pool. Uh, so it's so important that as soon as you see this kind of activity around your pool that you haze them away. So that just means acting like the biggest and scariest goose that you can to intimidate the smaller goose to move on and always look for signs of nest building by your pools too. And so any signs of nest building could just be a buildup of twigs underneath shrubs, any um, you know, little small dugout cavities underneath shrubs, things like that. And you wanna remove any signs of nest building immediately because as soon as one egg is laid in that nest, that egg is now federally protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So that means that you cannot remove that egg until that bird has hatched and until it has fledged and then you can start the process of encouraging them to leave. And so, you know, this can create big problems in uh, some of our yards where we do have pools. So it's just really important to look out for some of that activity in your yard. <laughs> and uh, back to the baby birds. So some things that we can do to keep our yards safe for birds. Uh, one thing is trimming vegetation outside of nesting season. So in the September to February months is a really good time to start trimming those trees just to make sure that we're not interfering with any potential chicks that might be in some of our trees. And you know, we don't want to damage those active bird nests. I would say if you, if you have to trim trees or remove nest, nesting material during those breeding seasons, just Make sure there's no birds nesting there first. Um, a lot of tree trimmers, if you hire someone, are trained in this too, and will assess the trees and vegetation that you're trying to trim. And you know, generally, even they discourage any sort of trimming activity to occur outside of the months of the September to February range. And if you suspect that you have birds breeding in your yard and you need to trim the trees or remove its habitat, just seek the assistance of a professional so that you can avoid harming that bird too. Just you know, remember that a lot of these birds are federally protected. So if you fail to take these sorts of precautions, then it would put you in violation of the federal laws as well. And uh, something else, I know I've mentioned this a couple of times, I'm gonna mention it just one more time. Um, just keep your pet cats indoors during nesting season, just because they do cause a threat to those baby and adult birds, uh, you know, especially during the time when they're incubating those eggs or you know, roosting at night, foraging at a feeder, all of those essential requirements for the survival of the birds. And if you have cat-like dogs, I might mention that you'd probably wanna do the same sort of thing with your dogs as well. Anna, if you use the landscape fabric, like I mentioned uh, when we were discussing artificial nest building, this can be dangerous for birds to use when building their nests. And so if you have landscape fabrics in your gardens, just making sure to stake it down pretty well, just so that birds can't tear it up and use it as a part of their nesting material. Um, I went to observe some of this action. It is starting very soon. Uh, so again, nesting season is March through August, usually in this area. I know personally, I've started to see um, some birds that are starting their mating rituals, I've seen some ravens and mockingbirds exhibiting some of that and building their nests. So 
There are birds getting ready for nesting season. And there are some cool behaviors that could help you determine uh, if you do have breeding birds or an active nest in your yard too. I would say if you repeatedly see a brightly colored bird or a dull colored bird in the same location, it's likely a breeding pair. So, you know, males are usually a lot brighter in color than females. And this isn't always the case, but in a lot of bird species, it's usually the males that are much more bright than the uh, more drab or dull colored females. They also may act aggressively toward other male birds uh, or even toward you if you get too close while they're nesting. So they wanna protect their territory and those little ones that they're about to lay eggs for. And you might also see birds carrying food too. So if you see them carrying food or nesting material like you see in this bird here, the mountain bluebird, uh, that might be a sign that they're building a nest somewhere. So. And a lot of bird species too, this occurs with both males and females. They'll both provide food to nestlings and provide that parental care to them. And you, you might even be able to hear some of those hungry nestlings soon too. So you'll hear that soft chattering or chirping coming from a location as well. Uh, I would say the most important thing too, if you are seeing this in your neighborhoods or in your yard, just making sure that you enjoy it from a distance. Uh, so again, you know, these animals were much bigger than a lot of these birds, all of these birds. So, you know, in their eyes, we are a huge threat to them and that can be pretty stressful for them. Uh, so getting too close, it might discourage those nesting behaviors. And, you know, that nesting behavior is required for these chicks to reach the adulthood. Uh, and another good reason to keep your space from some of these nests is that aggressive behavior. So mockingbirds, uh, you might have heard are very aggressive during nesting season. You might have experienced this yourself. It's called bird dive bombing. Uh, I've been dive bombed by a mockingbird once. It was terrifying. Uh, and they have no size limitations in who or what they will try to protect their nest from. Uh, so, so you see these photos here. We have a mockingbird that's attacking a cat and a mockingbird that's even pushing a hawk. Um, they are very mean, mean, aggressive, protective parents. And so you wanna make sure, especially if you're seeing mockingbirds, uh, that you're keeping a distance. You know, and other birds exhibit dive bombing behavior too. Uh, I know grackles are kind of known for it in our area as well. So. Just be mindful of that. If you are seeing any dive bombing behavior, you know, they might be going after your dogs or cats that are outside. Just, I would give that nesting area space. Uh, it's definitely going to stop once the babies have left the area. So once they've fledged and learned to fly, these mockingbird parents are no longer gonna, gonna be uh, territorial like that, but definitely giving them space while that baby birds, while those baby birds are still in the nest would help to protect you and them and your pets and everyone. I see uh, Deb says in the chat, we've been attacked by robins too. Yeah, so there's uh, several kinds of birds. I, I haven't seen that behavior in robins specifically, but you know, it doesn't surprise me. It's, they can get protective just like we're protective of our little ones too. You know, we wanna make sure that they make it to survival. So giving them space is always a good thing to do. And, I just want to take some time on this screen here too. It's a nice little flow chart that you can follow uh, that goes over essentially everything that we just went over during this webinar, just to kind of determine some of those steps that you might be able to take uh, when you do see a baby bird, you know, in your yard or in your neighborhood. And I can make this resource available if any of y'all are interested in holding on to it, I can definitely uh, shoot it to you in an email or something like that. I would say, you know, in general, observing nesting birds, it's a, it's a really cool opportunity for us to see nature in action. And it's one of the most common opportunities to see nature as well, especially with, you know, the abundance of feeders that we have in urban areas. Birds are definitely one of the more frequently sighted animals uh, that we get to observe. And so understanding them is very important. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, just like we wouldn't want a giraffe taking care of us. We need to remember that we're probably not the best caretakers for birds either. So just trusting those parents to provide that care 
to their baby birds uh, is usually the best course of action. And of course, with those special circumstances in mind as well. So just let them join the parenting and we can watch and we can enjoy them from a distance from the sidelines. You know, humans generally don't like it when uh, animals force themselves into our lives either. Think about, you know, bats in the attic or spiders in the sink. And the same kind of goes for birds too. They don't necessarily want a very big, scary animal to them to intervene on the lives of their baby birds either. And I wanna make mention too, that this applies to all young animals. So, you know, all animals have unique adaptations for survival. So removing what appears to be an abandoned bunny or a fawn, uh, it can be detrimental to their survival. And especially with uh, mammals like the fawns and rabbits. So those are animals that do have a good sense of smell. And so many times, uh, if they do smell, if parents will smell the human scent, that is a situation where they might not return to their young ones. So that's very important to keep in mind. And oftentimes, you know, with fawns, with baby deers, what the parents will do is they'll drop off their baby somewhere to go forage for the day. So a lot of times when we see what looks like abandoned wildlife, they're not actually abandoned. Um, they're just being left in a safe location so that when the parents are ready with food, they can return to them too. So, and I did add, you might notice on the flow chart too, uh, I threw a dinosaur in there. So the Archaeopteryx is the uh, linking or one of the hypothesized links between the evolution of dinosaurs to birds. So that if you do run into an Archaeopteryx, you can uh, call your local paleontologist and that would be the answer for that side of the flow chart. Um, <laughs> And if we see one of those in our yards, we probably do want to run as well. But at this point, I would like to open it up to questions. I know Claire has been doing an awesome job in the chat and the Q&A, helping y'all with some questions. So I am going to open up the Q&A too to see if there's any open ones. Um, and if you would like to ask questions, yeah, definitely take the time right now. Uh, and for those of you that do have to go before we get to questions, I'm gonna throw this slide up here too. So these are the webinars that we have coming up for the rest of the week. This whole week we've dedicated to urban wildlife. So we'll be chatting about all the cool city wildlife that we have for the entire week. So I encourage you to check out some of those as well if you have time to join. And I do wanna just say thank you to everyone who was able to join us here today. And if you have some questions, feel free. You can either put them in the Q&A or you can also uh, put them right in the chat too. And I can try to help you with some answers. And you'll notice too, my contact information is at the bottom there. So if you can't think of a question now to you, you can always feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to help uh, at another time as well. Oh, I see, I can't see the name, it's not, there we go. Um, Odessa says, I do have questions, look in the Q&A thingy. Oh, what about the cowbirds? Um, <laughs> oh, cowbirds, they're funny. Uh, they, yeah, they'll be territorial, if that's what you're asking. Uh, I see Clara did mention that they'll dive bomb if they feel threatened. They're also uh, kind of considered like a parasite bird. So cowbirds, what they'll do is the parents will drop off their eggs in other birds' nests. Cowbirds are like big, plump birds. They'll drop off their eggs in another bird's nest because they don't want to parent their own babies. And so when that egg hatches, the random songbird that got stuck with this egg will actually care for this baby thinking that it's their own baby. And once this cowbird hatches, it gets super large and it actually shoves all of the actual babies of this bird out of the nest. And then the parent bird is forced to take care of this cowbird instead. Uh, so it's a 
pretty <laughs> cruel cycle in cowbirds. Uh, I, very interesting though. I mean, I think the whole, the whole uh, food web can be kind of brutal, but fascinating at the same time. Yeah, and I hope that answered your question if it didn't. Um, oh, I see some other questions popping in too. Uh, someone asked, what would the Don't Dump Them webinar be about? <laughs> That's a great question. So that webinar is going to be focused around um, pretty much any feral wildlife that we might have in our environments and the effects of pet dumping and what that can do to the ecosystem and stuff like that. And so my coworker, Jess Wolf, she'll be putting that one on tonight. And I'd encourage you to go. This is a webinar we haven't done before, too. So it'll be interesting to I have that conversation with those that choose to participate with it as well. All right, and I see another question in the q and I live in Texas. We experienced a brutal snowstorm, found a bird huddled and shivering on the concrete of my front porch. So out of concern, I placed him in an open shoe box with lots of paper towels for warmth and it didn't make it. Make it. Why was this bird on my porch in the first place? I was wondering if it got lost, any ideas? That's a good question. I mean, it could just be that with the snowstorm, it got displaced. Maybe it was, depending on the bird too, if it was starting a migratory process and left too late um, and kind of got stuck in it. Or, you know, with snowstorms too, we have a lot of wind, so it could have pushed it out of its nest if it was a younger bird. You know, I would say you did what you could to try to revive it from some of that brutal weather that it experienced. And, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes, sometimes that, that sort of circumstance doesn't leave birds with a good chance of survival if they get stuck in weather that's a little bit too harsh for their normal survival needs. So I hope that answers it. I know you asked if, if it got lost. I assume that, you know, if it's a migratory bird, maybe it just left a little bit too late in the season and didn't get to miss the storm. And what about the birds who lost their parents? Um, I would say, I mean, generally the parent birds keep really good tabs on their young ones. And especially because of how vocal they are, they don't tend to stray too far, you know, and with baby birds limited mobility, it's hard for them to get too far unless, you know, a predator takes them away, away in some way, shape or form. Um, and again, in answering that, I would just say, you know, it is best just to kind of minimize any impact or interaction that we have with the bird. You know, if we do need to place it in a safer location under a shrub, but allow that bird to vocalize for itself to relocate its parents, that's usually the best course of action. Oh, and Stephanie says to add to hers before too, that it had trouble flying, mostly hopped around. Yeah, so it sounds like that was probably a fledgling. So it might've just been trying to get through the storm and um, didn't make it, unfortunately. Eduardo asked, in the case of doves, it is known that they produce some kind of milk to feed the chicks. Do you know any closer food formula to feed them in case chicks lose their parents? In my area, there are lots of cats that kill birds. That's a good question. Yeah, doves do produce, I'm not, I don't remember the exact name of the like milk that they produce. It's not like cow's milk or our milk. It's a little bit different. It's made, of, made up of different components, uh, you know, and it's definitely high and nutrients, specific nutrients that uh, are required for that specific species. In terms of any, you know, remade alternative formulas, I don't know that there's any that exist. And, you know, we definitely don't encourage trying to provide an alternative food source. We do provide, you know, we try to encourage the parents to take care of that for them. Um, you know, if, if anything, the best course of action would just be to contact a licensed rehabilitator and get some information from them on how to proceed in that sort of situation. Oh, and there's lots of cats that kill birds in your area. Yeah, yeah, this time of year too, uh, nesting season. It's a, it's a harsh world for those little baby birds sometimes. And thank you everyone for joining too. I don't see any open questions right now. Uh, feel free to pop them in. But again, too, I'll, uh, I'll be around uh, via email or phone. You have my contact information there. So feel free to reach out too if you have additional questions. And I 
guess with that, I will end it this afternoon. So thank you again. And maybe I'll see you for some of these upcoming webinars this week too. So y'all have a good day.